And so you have like these two people, two individuals with just very broken family experiences. Like my mom's driven for family. Like she's like, it's bred into her. And then my dad's just driven just to work hard. Like put your head down, work hard. No one cares how you feel. Like just get the work done. And so I think you just combine those two and obviously there's tons of, you know, tons of issues and conflicts or whatnot, but you just had like this overarching, like work hard and like put family first. Yo, 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 welcome to another episode of the Founder Podcast. Today is an extremely special day. First off, I'm wearing Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. <laughs> Dude, you can't get better than Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. On top of that, got my good friend, longtime business partner, Mr. Daryl Kelly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, you know, the people have been begging for this one, Daryl. Mm. Uh, I've been Bet getting a lot have. of comments like, where's Daryl at? Can we hear <clears throat> from the man behind the scenes that actually is doing all the work? Mm. Mm. Is that <laughs> what it is? <laughs> so, dude, uh, excited to have you. <clears throat> Tell your story a little bit. Um, dude, give us give us a little, little of your background. Like, if you were going to give a 30-second elevator pitch on who you are, what you do, mm. give it to us. So, yeah, the best way to describe who I am in the now. Um, so I am a father of four girls and been married for 17 years. My oldest is 16. And then I've got 13, 9, and soon to be 6-year-old. Um, grew up fourth of eight kids. So grew up in a big family in the middle. And, uh, let's see here. Trying to think of what I want to tell. I'll be outside of our conversation, but, um, I love riding dirt bikes. I love being outside. I love boating. Um, I just love goofing around. I feel like there's this different personality that comes out of me when I'm playing versus when I'm working. And, um, yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy doing, a lot. Of th I enjoy working. I enjoy creating. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy being at home. I enjoy lots of lots of things about life. So, Daryl, what is your first memory of me? Oh gosh, first memory. Well, if you ask my wife, I don't have a good memory, and uh, I'll say the probably the memory that some. Let's see here. First memory. I think the first like. Real memory would be when we uh, won that contest. The wheelbarrow one? The wheelbarrow one. Oh, oh baby. Like, obviously, we, we had had dinner, and we've met before that, but that was, like, the first, like, memory of, like, us, like, really, like, doing something together. There's, there's two things that uh, stick out about that experience. So what Daryl's referring to, uh, so Daryl was my first pest control manager. So Daryl's always, uh, you know, Daryl's two years older than me. We were born the same month, February. Daryl's turning 42 this February. I'm turning 40. Uh, and so he's always been a little older, a little wiser. And uh, so he was, he was my first manager, door-to-door -door sales. And uh, we did this, what they called Super Saturday. And essentially, essentially what it was, was uh, we, we got together and uh, there was training and there was competitions and different things. But there's two things that stick out to me about that day. One, we won the wheelbarrow contest, which was dope. So literally, you know, picking somebody else up and running. And I can't, was, I, was I the one on the I ground? I was. Yeah, yeah. Because Daryl Daryl is like light and strong, and I could just bull rush. And so, you know, I'm, I'm the driver. Daryl's just freaking flailing his arms. So that winning that was awesome. But the other thing that sticks out about that day, remember the guy that busted? Broke his, he broke his leg. His, was it his leg or his arm? His ankle. Remember his ankle popped Oh, dude, out? it was something gnarly. Yeah, that was bad. In a, in a wheelbarrow like, contest. Dude, dude well, they no, had to, like... So it wasn't about just winning the wheelbarrow contest. It was like we were winning, like, prize tickets. Yeah. Right? For the raffle. That was a different day, actually. Was it? I yes. feel like I feel like we I feel like we found the advantage of we could win this every time. Right. And so then we were getting, like, more raffle tickets. So, so we could win prizes. So there was two Super Saturdays, if I remember the, 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 uh, the story correctly. But the first, there were two different locations. The second one where the wheelbarrow race was like a place that was like big and open, had cement floors. Yeah. The other one was a, a smaller venue, but there, there was two reasons. 
so we were winning raffle tickets, and I won a, a big screen TV. TV. It's huge. Reason, it was like 24 inch or? Yeah, dude, it was 30, 37 inches. And at that point, Vizio was selling for 1800 bucks. Yeah, it, it was, was It was a big deal. <laughs> it was a big deal. It wasn't even that big, but it was so a big deal. Me and my wife had one car at the time. It was a Dodge Neon. And literally, we go out, and we had to take it out of the box, and it fit end-to-end, the TV, end-to-end in our back seat to the doors. Like, it was touching both yeah. doors. It was a tiny little car. But uh, there's there's actually two so two competitions. I ate a bunch of they, – they did this thing where they had, like, grasshoppers, and they're like, yeah. we'll give you, like, one ticket or ten raffle tickets for everyone you eat. So I literally went and ate everything they had. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like – Oh, this was supposed to last a whole lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't think one crazy guy would come in and eat all their bugs. Dude, there's that makes me think of um oh man. That makes me think of in uh North Carolina that summer when we were at a restaurant and I remember what you you ate something that no one else would I know eat. exactly what it was. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> we were at a barbecue joint. <laughs> Dude, so you guys know, like, I'm I'm the craziest, stupidest human being when it when it comes to like winning and competitions and stuff. Yes. So we're at a barbecue joint, and Daryl points at this huge bottle of barbecue <laughs> hot sauce. Like, I mean, dude, it was like, it was gnarly. Daryl's like, I'll give you. He says to somebody else, like, a hundred bucks if you drink this thing. I'm like, I'll do that for a hundred bucks. <laughs> and Daryl looks at me and he says, I'll give you twenty. <laughs> Do you remember? And so I'm like, screw it. I'll do it for 20 bucks. Dude, I drank that whole thing. My stomach <laughs> felt like it had a hole in it for the rest of the night. Dude, it hurt so uh, bad. I, uh, yeah, I remember you saying that afterwards. Oh. That was funny. All for 20 bucks. <laughs> but, you know, the way that we grew up, man, I mean, 20 bucks 20 was, bucks a, big was deal. a big deal back then. So tell us about growing up. You, uh, you, have, a, you have a cool story about, like, where you grew up and kind of what all the kids have ended up doing. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I grew up as the fourth of, um, fourth kid of eight. I kind of, I consider myself the, I say I'm the, I'm the, the oldest, what do I call myself? The second oldest. And the reason I say that is because it was my oldest brother, sister, sister, then it was me and then brother, brother, brother. And so I had like this, I was like the middle clan. So I kind of controlled the majority of people because we, all played together the boy, and the boys dominated and so that was, we were just always yeah just making a mess of things or having fun or um so i grew up on the farm and um we didn't have a we didn't have much um as far as uh actually i don't know back then we just we played a ton right and then uh we played in the ditches or in the you canals. didn't know what you didn't have we didn't know what we didn't have but we played with yeah, we were always up in the trees. We we're playing in the ditches, jumping bikes in the ditches. We just had fun. And um, yeah, it was a good time. It, it was, I loved it out there. I loved it out on the farm. I worked a lot though. And, uh, and I think that's where I remember I'd work all summer. And I'd, I mean, when I would harvest wheat, for example, I'd be working 14, 16 hour days driving a combine. And into the summer would come and I'd be like, you got like three grand. If. Maybe. Twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah, uh, the more money I made, the more like, pretty much the more bills I paid. Like <laughs> there was always something that needed to be paid. <laughs> if I had the money to pay it. So were your parents like asking you to pay bills for the house? Um, no, not for the house. Uh, but I mean, like, yeah, car insurance, tires, you know. So you basically your so, parents said you make money, you're responsible more for your own consumption. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I love it. Love it. So Daryl, the way Daryl and I are originally connected is Daryl is married to, or not Daryl, Daryl's oldest brother is married to my oldest sister. And so we were first introduced when we were like 14. And like one of my earliest memories of going over to the Kelly household was, uh, so I was, I was friends with uh, Daryl's two next brothers, Bryce and uh, Tyler. Uh, I was like, I, me and Tyler are the same age, Bryce a little bit younger. Daryl was the cool guy that didn't hang out with us because he was two years older, you know. Dude, I'm telling you, my my family talked me up. Like my wife, she knew my family before she knew me, and they all just spoke so highly of me because I was always gone, and it was it was great. There was there was one memory I have of Daryl during those years because 
our our siblings got married when when I was like 13 or 14 and we went out on your trampoline and we were practicing uh, wakeboarding tricks but even then right during that summer I mean I was doing combine so I was working I remember because right. I had to like stop to go to the wedding but I was yeah just working a lot yeah but uh one of, one of the early memories I had so going in these guys lived in a double wide trailer three bedrooms eight kids right and uh you go into the boys' room, and there are five beds in a double-wide trailer bedroom. I mean, double-wide trailer bedroom, what are you, like 10 by 10, 12 by 12? I mean, it's like... Never measured it, but yeah. yeah. I mean, literally two, literally... two bunk beds, two bunk beds, one dresser in between. So bunk bed, bunk bed, bed in between. There was literally like a tiny walkway. There was a spot that was like... To, to like shimmy through. To shimmy through. Yeah. yeah. And we did a sleepover. I think me and Tony came <laughs> over. It's like, dude, there are seven dudes in this room. <laughs> oh, that was a good time. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, what, uh, what are like some of your foundational memories or experiences that like helped you, you and your family turn into the great people that you are? You know, I've always wondered that because everyone wants to contribute success to certain certain experiences or whatnot. And I have no idea really what to connect it to. You know, I think my dad and mom have always been principle based, you know, this is what we do. This is who we are. This is why we do it. Um, I've, I learned how to work hard from my dad. I think we all did. And, you know, he's not short of, of working hard. So I think that was something we learned from him. And then, um, you know, another unique thing is I grew up with, uh, there's a, there's a one friend that lived out there my age and um he he grew up on a feedlot he had horses mm -hmm. his family ran the feedlot and for some reason like i literally went on a lot of their family camping trips mm. i was around horses a lot and i think um i think that's cool too i think being around horses these big animals that have a lot of power and when you're trying to train a horse break a horse um you have to deal with, like not being in control but being in control of what's goes on type of thing. And, uh, and, you know, just learning how to be calm in the moment, regardless of the chaos and try to, you know, sort through whatever issue is coming. You know, I, I think about that a lot too. I think there's a big influence there. Um, experiencing, experiencing that as a, a lot as a kid. And, and we had a lot of fun, rode a ton of horses and, and, uh, had a lot of fun doing that. So obviously Whatever happened in the household, you know, bred some winners. You know, you have a lot of athletes in the family, a lot of successful people. So you, you think it through. So you got eight kids. Ryan, the oldest, he's been a successful salesperson in, involved in, like, selling big contracts to, to uh, farmers. And then, and then you got uh, your sister who married a doctor, her, your other sister who's uh, married a, a successful like project manager, software developer. Uh, then there's there's you who's had success in business. You got Tyler who is a doctor. You got Bryce who started and sold a big medical firm to you know private equity. Mm -hmm. Then you got then you got Shane who's a doctor, and then you got Ashley. We're still wondering about her and her choices. I'm just joking. She she married one of our uh, one of our business partners, Hayden. And so, like, eight people, all financially successful, all made incredible choices, have incredible families, you know, and, and you know, started in a, in a trailer. Your family's been able to stick together. Uh, so what, uh, what, are, what are, like, some key uh, – how, how have you guys been able to, like, stick together throughout all the years and maintain really good relationships? Like what, what do you say? To some of the no, that's keys? a, that's a good question. I have a ton of ideas coming to my mind of some of the things that I do attribute to. Um, so if you look at my parents, right, you got my mom and you have my dad. So my mom grew up with, you know, alcoholic parents. Her mom died from alcohol when she was 14. She was mm -hmm. home alone with her. Um, after that she bounced around and stuff. You have my dad who, I mean, his parents, um, his mom was loving his dad, probably more selfish kind of guy. Um, didn't really care for him much by age six, like his family would, you know, he would go out and work on the farm all summer and didn't need to. It just, his parents just kind of got him out of the, out of the house that way. And so you have like 
these two people, two individuals with just very broken family experiences. And like my mom's driven for family. Like she's like, it's bred into her. And then my dad's just driven just to work hard. Like put your head down, work hard. No one cares how you feel. Like just get the work done. And so I think you just combine those two. And obviously there's tons of, you know, tons of issues and conflicts or whatnot, but you just had like this overarching, like work hard and like put family first. And that was just always like driven into absolutely everything we did. You know, we, we, we lived in a small, I didn't look at a small, but looking back, I mean, we were pretty close, right? Looking back as a small house, but like, didn't feel that way living there. But, um, so then we just had to learn to live with all these people around you, right? And learn to love it. You don't have a choice. You're either going to be excited about it or absolutely hate it. And, you know, my sisters, I, it was entertaining watching them sometimes complain about things, but, um, cause they're older than me, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think you combine like the kind of the mission of what my mom and dad wanted and, and what that put or instilled into us, us kids. And I think that's what you have. Why Speaking you have, of your have. dad, let's, let's talk Papa Bob. Love Bob. So Bob, Bob's like one of the most unique, cool dudes I know. So extremely intelligent, uh, from a standpoint of like, well-read, uh, watches the news probably way too much. Uh, you know, loves Fox News and, and all, uh, all the, you know, super conservative, real good guy. Um, you know, probably like one of the coolest, like silent cheerleaders we have out there. Oh, yeah. You know, I, one, one thing I love about Bob is like, you know, we, so we had our jet for about a year and a half. And whenever we were taking off, he would pull up and like watch us take off. Not only that, he would watch every flight on his phone. Right. He tracked, tracked the flights, like, where are we at, what we're doing. He's over there. He's, like, cheering, super proud, you know, but, but at the same time, like, super silent about the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. Like, he, you know, he wouldn't necessarily let you know that he's cheering, but if you, like, talk to him, you realize, holy crap, this guy has literally followed every step of what I've done for the last however many years. For sure. So my dad, so something super interesting about my dad, he, um, so his dad passed away a few months ago and he reached out or, um, anyways, I, I, I knew that that was a fractured relationship. So I sat down with my dad. I'm like, all right, dad. So how do you feel about this? He's like, I don't want to talk about it. I'm like, great. Well, guess what? That's your dad. You're his son. You're my dad. I'm your son you're going to talk about that relationship because it impacts our relationships. So let's talk about it. You know, there's no not talking about it. So we start talking about it and I'm like, you know, what's, what's probably the, what's the one thing that he said to you that hurt the most? And he said, after I graduated, my dad told me to leave the house and never come back. And I thought that's the thing that hurt the most. Mm. He said, yes. Ouch. That my, hurts. My dad told me the exact same thing. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. But it didn't hurt you. I said, dad, I said, that's funny. Cause he knew obviously he had said it to me. I said, it's pretty funny that you say that and that you said it to me. And I said, and it just came to me in the moment. I said, you know, I think that message was always meant for me because it really did push me out of the house and it pushed me to go just explore. And I met some amazing people that I would have not met otherwise. And I kind of took them back of like, and I told him, I said, I'm sorry that that was hard on you and that you had to hear that and hold on to that message for so long for me. But I am so grateful that you, you told, told me that. That's cool. That's cool. So dude, we've, uh, we've experienced a lot together. So Daryl and I have been business partners for essentially 19 years. And, you know, we've, We've traveled all over the world, been to China, Croatia, Italy, Nepal, uh, Central America, uh, Mexico, you know, the, the Caribbean, Canada, all over the U.S. Like, what are, what are some of your most favorite memories of building businesses or just like unique experiences that we've had over the years? I mean, I'll be honest, my favorite is the library. So the library was a funny situation because <clears throat> um, I, had, I had like 
I had been working in pest control for quite a while. I had a, a big region of uh, teams built up and um, I ended up shifting and, and going to work with another company and that company just had nothing in place. It was just a complete sham. And so things just flattened out there. And so I had to rebuild and just kind of start from scratch. And, and I really, you know, I, I basically just led my, all my teams to like a dead end. It was, it was pretty. And for perspective, this is like January of 2010. Oh, the library. Yeah. Yep. And so, yeah, so I just graduated, you know, I thought maybe I'll just go get a job. 2008. Uh, yeah. Good luck. So I, I take my degree. I go try to apply for a few jobs. The FBI is one of them. Um, <laughs> there's like this technology Can you imagine firm. working for the FBI? <laughs> that would have been terrible. Well, I think my there was enough on my resume that they were interested, and then I took this test, and there was, there was questions in there. They were like, if... They're like, have you ever paid anyone to drink a full bottle of barbecue <laughs> sauce? Like, off the list. <laughs> no, it was like, if you go to the gas station, they give you 24 cents more, and you don't realize until you get in your car, what, what do you do? do? Oh, I'm like, God. I'm gone. I'm leaving. I'm not returning 24 <laughs> cents. I'm like, they're, you're out of here. I don't have a clue what they're looking for there, but I'm sure I wasn't the, I wasn't the guy. Uh, so, um, but anyways, yeah. So then I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta figure something out. And I mean, I don't know if we want to rewind, but you know, Chris and I hadn't talked for like two years at this point. So we kind of had a falling out. The, so to be clear, Daryl's fault. <laughs> so <laughs> of course. So yeah, we, we sell together summer 2006. We're selling pest control, right? And I was very entrepreneurial from the get go. And like before we had ever even gone out for the summer, I was like telling Daryl that like, dude, let's do something together. Like, and, and we had looked into uh, potentially starting up a, a branch for this company, uh, doing a uh, uh, franchise, a franchise through through Point Pest Control. And uh, and so we like we were talking about this, and I was like starting to like make some plans a little bit around it, like fantasize, you know me, big dreamer, big dreamer. And uh, we would go out, have a good summer. And then like, nothing came of it. And Daryl like just kind of went back to school and was doing the thing. And I'm like, dude, I thought we were talking about taking over the world. Like, and, and so then, uh, then I go and, uh, and so it's not entirely Daryl's fault, but, uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I get it. I have a buddy that uh, I grew up with comes and approaches me and says, "Hey, come and sell security systems." And uh, frankly, I didn't know how to like address it with Daryl, and so I just kind of like fizzled out and went and and sold security because I thought it was a better opportunity. And Daryl was no longer like for me. I was looking for more opportunity, and Daryl wasn't really wanting to pursue the the pest control more opportunity. And so I saw this home security thing as like another opportunity. It turned out great for me initial the initial year and so but that led to me and daryl kind of you know breaking up and yeah yeah so we didn't talk for a couple of years and then um i just remember thinking like i should just i should go talk to chris swallow my pride go talk to chris was that when we went and had dinner and you had long hair maybe we hadn't talked for like a year and a half and then like our wives decided that we needed to like have dinner and we went i think we went to like applebee's or something and we come and Daryl's got long curly hair. <laughs> what the freak? And anybody that remembers like 07, 08, that was dope. <laughs> to have like a little bit of a a little bit of a shag, a little bit, you know, curling around the hat or something. Yep. Uh, that's right. And so, anyways. Yeah. So then we meet up and it was interesting because, you know, Chris at the time, you know, he's driving this Mercedes. I go to his office, he's got a waterfall at, in the entry I mean, point. Who doesn't want a waterfall in their entry? He's 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 wearing a suit to work, custom suit. And I'm just thinking, wow, this guy is just blinging mm. out of control. Out of control, dude. My father-in-law's money was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, you know what? I've got to make something happen here. I got to figure out what it is. I didn't want to work with Chris and like his security business, um, just because I knew that was I had nothing to do with it. So I'm like, Chris, we should uh, look at doing something. He's like, yeah, let's do it. He was all interested. I'm like, okay, let's do it. Didn't know why he was so interested. <laughs> Meanwhile, backstory, I'm like, I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> Can barely pay my bills. <laughs> yeah, I had the facade going on. Like, it all looked good. But, 
Like we are barely covering payroll every single month. And I think I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm right about that time maxing out my personal credit card to make payroll. And so, you know, looking good to everybody, but meanwhile, just scrambling. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, let's, let's talk. And that's what I loved about Chris beforehand is like, when we would just start talking, we would talk, 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 and there'd be no limitations. And it's like, how big can we, can we make this? Um, so I'm like, dude, let's, let's talk. So we, we, uh, we decided we're going to go to the library and we're going to come up with an idea on how to make money. And mm. that's, and cause I needed money. I needed cash. So did I. Didn't know that. So <laughs> just me <laughs> from my perspective. Um, but yeah, so we were definitely aligned there. Um, and so we went to the library and, uh, you know, we come up with the coupon book and then it was like, so I, I remember the idea originated. So your stepfather-in-law had like helped do this fundraiser yep. for some coupon book up here in the tri cities. And I mean, we were living in Utah at this time and, and we're like, wait, what we can team up with a fundraiser. And so kind of the, the nitty gritty of that was like, we're like, all right, let's find someone that needs some proceeds from us selling. And so we found like some like local lacrosse lacrosse team. Yeah. And we were going to give them like a dollar of every sale that we made. And, and so, <laughs> yep. yeah. Yeah. So we, I mean, we went knock doors with businesses. We come up with a coupon book. Really good one, actually. It was dope. It was really good. Like it, it was actually one of my first lessons on like, networking and like just reaching out to people and just asking for things. Yeah. So we went through and we did, uh, we got all the coupons we needed and then we, do you remember some of those coupons? Yeah. Which ones were they? Buy one, get one free at the ski resort. Dude, that was dope. I don't remember how uh, that was a connection that I had like a friend of a friend. Someone knew somebody at this ski resort and I like reached out and we we're just like, yo, yeah. Would you do something really cool? We had, Basically, our, our ask was, for the listeners, it was like, hey, Mr. Business Owner, we're going to let you advertise for free in our coupon book, yep. but it's got to be a dope coupon. Give us a good coupon. We had like free oil changes. Yeah, three free oil changes. We had... We had uh, uh, orthodontics. We had, it was that, like, was a, that was a big one. It was, a, it was like 1000 or $2,000 off the normal price of orthodontics, and he said he would do that in exchange for being like the front of the coupon book. Yeah, we had, um, I remember a salon. I don't remember the offer. I think we had a couple free haircuts. Um, dude, we even got stuff from like Del Taco. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. I remember being in there. For whatever reason, I have a distinct memory of being in Del Taco's parking lot. We were strategizing and we're like, dude, how do we like go into Del Taco and talk to somebody in charge, right? Yeah. Like th this doesn't make any sense, but we did it. And somehow we got a hold of like the person that could give it to us. Yeah, it, worked. it was like it all came together quick. And then we... Um, I still remember the numbers. Do you remember the numbers, how you did it? How we did it? No. Oh, are you, are you saying the sell? The economics. Well, so first, so then, we, so then we put it together, right? I designed it. Yep. Shipped it off. So where were the numbers? So, and meanwhile, I remember thinking like, okay, who do we know that can print this? Right next to Five Diamond, which was my company, there was a little printing company. That's right. And, and I went and quoted out 83 cents to print a book. And so we had this full color copy book with like tearaway coupons um, for 83 cents. And we priced them at 20 bucks. 20 bucks. Yep. Yeah. And then we, and then we're like, okay, how do we sell these things? And we started a uh, Craigslist. We got a bunch of people from Craigslist. Craigslist we, and KSL. I think we'd give them what? 10, 10 coupon books. Yep. They'd have to give us the money and then we'd give them 10 more. So yeah, exactly. So we would, it, it, dude, it was the ghettoest thing. Like ever. it was great. Like in the morning they would come to my freaking town home. Right. And you were there. Like we would have like a box full of them. And I mean, these guys are druggies, you know, like people coming in, that are willing just to hustle for the day to get paid cash the same day. Yes. Right. And so they're coming in, they're checking out. I think we checked out upwards, like for good guys, we'd give them 20 yeah. bucks. Right. And then, I remember like the lesson on like we went and like created it, the coupon book LLC. We we got a bank account at Wells Fargo. So guys could take they could take cash or check to the coupon book LLC. Yep. Right. And so they would go out and they'd come back is whatever they return back if they had checks and and uh and cash, then we'd give them half of it back. We'd pay them ten bucks a book and we took the rest of the proceeds. So we were making like 
eight bucks because we pay a dollar to the to the lacrosse group. Yep. Made eight dollars a book. And dude, we were making I don't know, you I think I think we made like ten grand in like twenty days. Yeah, it was good. It was I remember thinking like this this is working. Right. Right. Keep it going. But then <laughs> oh, it's so funny, like had we dug that deeper and actually like stuck with it, dude, it could have been something crazy. Oh, for sure. Right? Like it, it's so it's so crazy to think back, like how many things we got off the ground and then just fizzled out because like we lost passion. We didn't take, yeah. And then, and then that, well, cause we were like, okay, what's, what's next? This worked out pretty quick, pretty well. How do we grow so the next thing? What's, what's bigger? How can we right. leverage something else? And then that's when we're like, well, let me show you alarms. I'm like, let's do it. Um, mm. Dude, it wasn't, wasn't it at that time? Yeah. We went down to Houston first, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Aaron Negretti. <laughs> My man. Oh, uh, so dude, and I think by this time I opened up to Daryl that like, oh yeah, this time I knew what was going on. Like things aren't going great, and I'm needing to make money too. And so I told him kind of we you know we had like four offices set up at the time, and we need to make sales year round, and you can make pretty good cash. And he's like, all right, I'll go sell. And so me and Daryl pick up, we leave our families in Utah, we go down to Houston. No joke, we are sleeping in this guy's like uh, closet. Or at least I was. Where, where were you sleeping? I mean, I was on the floor. I think uh, I was sleeping in an air mattress in this guy's closet. Yeah. And you know, I'm the owner of the business. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious to think back. <laughs> and I'm sleeping. Uh, I'm sleeping in this guy's closet, hustling <laughs> to make a buck, dude. Uh, oh, Aaron. Aaron Negretti was. He was dope. He was such a cool guy. I mean, uh, first off, we're just crashing on his floor. This guy was like, he is a killer sales guy. Killer sales guy. Dude, he's got... Super nice apartment, too. Dude, like he, like he was spending every dollar he was making, right? Like, super nice apartment. He's got a Porsche Cayenne or whatever it was. Uh, one, of the, one of the funniest memories of Aaron is, like, we pull up into a grocery store, and he pulls into a handicapped space, and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, don't worry about it. Pulls open thing. He's got a handicap yeah. thing that he pops in the window. He's like, yeah, my doctor buddy hooked me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Aaron oh. was, uh, I loved Aaron. Oh. Like, he was a cool guy. Speaking of which, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this stat, but like uh, with, uh, they, they did a morality test on, you know, just a uh, uh, poll out there. And they said, okay, on a scale of zero to 10 or one to 10, 10 being the most immoral thing, one being uh, the least immoral thing what would you rate cheating on your spouse and it was like a four or five and then parking in a handicap was like <laughs> seven and dude, no Ooh. joke people in the u.s think that it's more immoral to park in a handicap spot than to cheat on your spouse you guys need to go to you you should be burned for that yeah. So then, uh, yeah. So then we built that up and, uh, man, I don't know if we're going through the whole story, but my favorite memory was, was just sitting down at the library, coming up with an idea, executing on it and, uh, just making it happen. And then we just, we've done that over and over again, but I just remember that being like the, the first time that we, we said, Hey, let's, let's do something. So Daryl, when we chose to like split up again and just kind of go our own separate ways, but it was a good, it was a good thing. Like, why did you pursue bees? Um, Daryl went and became a bee farmer. By the way. I mean, I just, I saw this business and uh, I mean, I grew up on the farm, right? Like nostalgia, nostalgia. And it wasn't just like uh, any bee farm. This guy was a pretty big bee farm, right. you know? Um, I know it just sounds funny though. It's a crazy business. I mean, you look at the numbers, right? He's, he was doing about 3 million in revenue. Um, he was making, I mean, he had everything paid off, no debt. He was making about a million a, a year. Which back then seemed like a hundred million. Yes, for sure. Right? Like, it was huge. Yeah, now that you say that it was only three million in revenue, I'm like, that's it. I remember thinking you were going to be a part of this big farm. Like <laughs> three, you know, it's cool. I, like granted, you know, it's cool that he was making a million bucks a year, but man, dude, it literally seemed like a hundred million. Yeah, so I mean that's that's the thing. I mean, growing up on the farm, I, I like yeah. So that was kind of the the draw there. Someone passed the information on. I'm like, I'll check this out, and 
I think we were just at a time where we were just trying to figure things out, didn't know really what we were doing or not doing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like we had like this direction. It was more of us going back to what you said earlier, where we were just like, what are we, where are we going with this? Yeah, I, I know like that point in my career, I just didn't really have any direction. It was just like trying to make money. It was trying to hustle, trying yeah. to do just whatever it was to make a buck. There wasn't like an end goal in sight or something that was being built to, to sell. And so, I mean, for me, that's why the pivot was like, go back and work for other people because I needed to go and learn more. Yep. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. So obviously that, that was a, that was an awesome memory, core memory for you. Where, where's been the, the, your favorite place that business travel has taken you? Mm, favorite place, Lake Powell. Lake Powell. Our, our summer trips there in Eclipse. That, that was pretty cool. Um, let's see here for business. Let me think here. I still remember when we worked for Legacy, eating at a restaurant in New York, and we all the, the 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 tower yes. of appetizer. It was tower, but it was like a two hundred dollar appetizer. But then they brought out this one carrot, and someone took a bite of the carrot, and they're like, "Guys, this is the most delicious carrot I've ever had." I'm like, "Okay." Someone else takes a bite of it, dude. This carrot is amazing. Anyways, as you can see, us couple small town kids, we're easily impressed. But that whole table was like drooling over this carrot because there was probably only like six pieces of this carrot with just one big carrot cut up. <laughs> and he was, I got a piece of it. It was like delicious. It was amazing. Don't know why that was such a profound memory, but. Uh, what are your, uh, who are your biggest mentors and how have they impacted you? <clears throat> um, biggest mentors. Oof. I mean, for I, me, when, if I'm thinking about you, who yeah. I would think you'd say is like, Tony Robbins, Joe Dispenza, you know, some people like that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking like memories back in the day, so I think of different people. Um, you know, Jeff Scholes back in the day, he was definitely a, a – he, he inspired me a lot. So you guys know Jeff, Jeff was like the guy that believed in us when nobody else did. Um, so after I'd filed bankruptcy, Daryl and I started K2K Alarm, and – one of the things that we wanted to shift was instead of selling contracts off to uh, monitoring companies, we wanted to in-house them and own them because we saw um, a lot of volatility because essentially what had happened with my business was the company buying our contracts said, hey, we can only buy 100 a month. We needed 120 to break even. And they said, you can't sell in these areas. You can't sell them to anybody else. It was like the craziest like catch-22. And so Jeff, when we started our company, had come in and said, yo, I think you guys are cool. I believe in you. And he actually gave us cash to go and front the money to install these, uh, these, con or these systems in, in homes and hold the contracts ourselves. Yeah. And so when literally nobody should have believed in us, Yeah. like, especially me, like, uh, luckily I had Daryl with me, but, and like, I just filed being bankruptcy for 2.2 million. And this guy was willing to like, front it was like a few hundred thousand for us to it was a lot it was a big deal um the thing though i, I appreciate most about jeff was i remember when i worked with, i lived with him so he was one of the guys where you know my dad saying hey don't come home which meant you can come home and visit don't come home and live and so jeff was a guy i reached out to because i heard he was you know yeah i knew he had a business and that he had money so i'm like come maybe he'll give me a job so i reached out to him and he let me live with him for a few months. Um, I think total seven months, but, and, uh, he treated me like he would have treated royalty. And that was the first time I, I saw like someone who didn't have to treat me good, treat me better than I felt like I deserved. And that always stuck with me. I thought, you know what, that's how I want to be. He always put people above money and he always took care of his employees. He took care of his people. And so that was just like a, big that was just a big lesson early on of just treat people good and uh yeah and don't don't put money over over people i mean you see that a lot when you're just when you don't know what to do like a lot of times you're like protect your money first and you don't realize like it doesn't matter like money's gonna come and go you know but to, to have good people and good relationships like that's the that's the battle that's that's worth fighting for and i luckily learned that from him love it love it Shifting gears from mentors, thoughts on uh, current uh, government, thoughts on Joe Biden for president 2024. Let's go, Joe Biden. 
Donald Trump. Let's go Trump. Dude, let's, let's just set, let's put them all in the White House. I mean, what uh, what what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on the the current uh, government situation? <clears throat> well, um, I think it's a complete mess right now, and I think the messier it gets, the the quicker we get out of it. But I don't know if that's how long it's going to be. Yeah. Like, so who are you voting for? Uh, I'm voting for um, uh, Kennedy. Kennedy. My boy Kennedy. So what if Kennedy doesn't doesn't run on his own? Dude, Trump and Kennedy. Trump and Kennedy. It's my ticket. Dude, what are your thoughts on Vivek? Uh, Have I, you watched much of his? Stuff? No, I mean I know he's good at debate, but I mean that's a that's a <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Probably the most well oriented guy out there. Like the way that he speaks. I mean, dude, he's the Ben uh, Shapiro uh, uh, of the of the ticket right now. It's, as far as just understands policies and history and everything else, like so well spoken, it's pretty phenomenal. And and uh, you know, there's a lot of debate out there. It's like, is he real? Is he fake? Is he is he AI? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think the tough part when I look at politics is that like all the, I just I don't feel like we're talking about real solutions. I think we're talking about problems. Yeah. Right. I mean, imagine if. Imagine if uh, running a business, all you do is you focus on your problems. You put all your energy in your problems versus like figuring out, okay, what's causing these problems? Right. You know, how do you, how far upstream do you go to figure out where the real issue is? Right. Politics, I feel like don't really do that. They're more like, let's manage the war. Let's manage the chaos. And like, uh, I just, so like the, the arguments, I mean, he's, he's probably great at arguing, but like the tough part is the real conversations that will actually change. Dude, it's tough, man. Like, we're such in an extreme society right now. Like, we either go super far left, super far right. And, you know, I'm a conservative by, by nature. Of course, you know that. But um, it's like I'm to the point where I feel like we've got to go super center for anything to get done. And I think, you know, uh, Kennedy is, is a fantastic candidate because of that. I've listened to him the most, like sound bites online, and I might listen to the same ones over and over again. I don't know, but like everything he says, I can't, I don't argue with. I, I like his stance on drugs. I like his stance on, I don't even know his stance on drugs. He's mentioned a few things about drugs that I'm like, yeah, because my perspective is like, it, it's, it's, <clears throat> I don't do drugs because they're illegal. Like, I don't do drugs because I care about my body. I care about myself. I care about my future. And, like, so it's, like, it's not about, like, stopping drugs from being used. It's, like, what are we – how are we educating people? And, like, what's the focus of our society? Right. And so it's, like, yeah, let's go argue drugs all we want, but that's not going to change things. You know, it's interesting you bring up drugs. So I've always believed – so I've kind of been more libertarian from a standpoint of, like, Hey, just legalize things and, and it'll naturally weed people out from a, from a standpoint of like people that don't want to do drugs won't do drugs and people that do do and they'll do them regardless and and it drives down cartels and everything like that's always been my belief yeah but it's interesting so i watched a youtube the other day it was uh about vancouver canada have you heard about this no so they legalized everything like oh, okay everything and dude it is a war zone Really? Like, yeah, just in the last 12 months. And this guy uh, went down, YouTuber, and he's, like, interviewing these homeless druggies and stuff. And they're, like, just spreading and taking over. And it's, like, it's pretty wild. Like, they've even created facilities that allow people to do drugs safely, essentially. And, and it's supposed to be this nice, safe, clean environment, clean needles, all that stuff like that. You go in, and it's, like probably the dirtiest place you've ever been in. And, and so it, it, it's like weird regarding I mean, that policy, like where, where is the balance, right? It's almost like you create strict rules, strict laws to keep people who don't have self-control, but then like focus on like the things that will actually help people the most. The education. The education. Right. You know, yeah. I mean. The higher law. The same thing with like abortion. It's like, oh my gosh, like debating abortion, it's like. Right. What are, you, what are you really debating? And I really think it's like how you see the family unit, like how important is the family and connection with God. Like, you know, I think if you, if the focus is really around those two things, I don't think you have an abortion argument, right? I think you have a, you have like, you have people that are, that are sent around principles and stuff. And I mean, there always will be, you know, two sides to every story, but 
instead it's like let's argue abortion and let's argue until we're blue every political <laughs> every political um i mean debate dude. they have to they have to talk about abortion it's like it never changes it's like let's talk about like what's causing people to like get to this point no right. one no one's like hey i want to have an abortion let's go get me pregnant so then i can go have an abortion because it's kind of a fun thing to do these days like that's not that's not the case and um so that's the thing is like my mind thinks is like what's the real conversation that would actually make the change and and can you even ever have that conversation like how do you get that to be the public conversation I, I don't know I don't know if there's there's an answer to that but that's speaking of the right conversation what's your favorite conspiracy theory um gosh the moon one I just want to know we didn't go to the moon I know just like just someone say it from the government, like right. here's proof we didn't go to the moon. I'm like, Dude, right? all right, cool. Like that is that is the one that's hardest for me to believe from a standpoint that we actually went, right? Like I, so there's two ones I'll come out and say like that I am a big believer in this particular conspiracy. One, we didn't land on the moon, and two, the 9/11 thing. Like both those are super sketch to me, and like there's so much evidence in the contrary. Oh, 9/11, yeah, yeah. It, it's just like. You know, like 9-11, I got like, dude, building number seven. How does it randomly implode two blocks away? Like, come on, are you kidding me? Well, I don't, I don't know if you saw like Alex Jones on Joe Rogan. Or no, on Tucker, Car Tucker, Tucker Carlson. Carlson. I haven't seen it. But he basically was like predicted it in July. Mm. And he's like, yeah, I've read their stuff. I've seen what they're talking about. This is why I said what I said, that that, right. that would happen. So, dude, it's, yeah. it's wild. One of my favorite conspiracy theories that I don't necessarily believe, but that is just like fun, yeah, is Tartaria. Tartaria's, yeah. You know, like I, I think what Tartaria opens up more than anything is like how easy it is to manipulate history. You know, and and I think that's probably like going through the the whole uh, pandemic in twenty twenty, whatever that one's called. Uh, you know, I don't want to get this censored on anything. Uh, uh, you know, that really opened your mind up. Like, holy smokes, we are in such a controlled environment that is manipulated by government, by society, by the news. Like, it's so wild. And so you got this thing at Tartaria where it's like this ancient society that, that, that was, like, thriving and had its own free energy source and whatnot, and that supposedly it's been wiped from the history books. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that there's, like, old document, old classified documents that actually refer to the Tartarian Empire being removed. And, and it's like, once again, I don't necessarily know what to believe regarding that. And I don't, I'm not, like, hard stance like I am on the moon. With the moon, I'm just like, yeah, dude, we didn't land on the moon. Tartarian is like, man, this is fascinating. And so, like, that, that, one's, that one's got me, like, questioning. But, like I said, more importantly, it's just, like, how easy it is, how close are we to just completely changing history by manipulating the education of just like one to two generations. All right. Bigfoot, real, fake. Dude, Bigfoot, fake. Um, yeah, it's gotta be fake. Uh, it's real. What do you believe? I mean, are we talking believe pain? or conspiracy? I mean, no, what do you believe? You're saying it's like, I believe that we did not land on the moon. Oh, I have, I have no evidence of Bigfoot. So I got, right, right, I got nothing to stand on. So like, I, I believe that 9-11 was an inside job, and I believe that we didn't land on that. As a Boy Scout kid, I was scared so many times <laughs> of Bigfoot in the mountains as I'm walking through the mountains that uh, he's real in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. What are some books that changed your life? Um, <clears throat> great books. I love a um, simple book that I love. I've shared the most. And I usually give it to, to kids is uh, Rhythm of Life by Matthew Kelly. Nice. I just love the the simplicity of his messages, like uh, becoming the better version, best version of yourself. Yep. How we're always working on the next version. Yep. And so there's never there's never any issues with with who you are. It's just work on the next version and just love become it. the next version and the next version. And you're always working on that better version or that best version of yourself. So I I love that book. Um, <clears throat> yeah, funny funny. So book, um, rich dad poor dad. Mm -hmm. So. I remember uh, we moved to do the alarm company here, right after uh, after Utah, and I remember you you. Um, 
I don't know you or me or what, but we decided let's read this book together. And what's funny was, you know, back in second grade, you know what actually inspired it? What? You remember Andrew Baldwin? Yeah. So he had said something during like a correlation meeting. We had like six sales reps, right? And he had said something about how rich that poor dad had changed his life and everything. I haven't even read that. And so I think that's what inspired it. So here's what's funny. I've graduated college by this time. Right. In second grade, I remember being in a group trying to learn how to read or get help reading. And I remember being told, oh, yeah, the reason you're a part of this group is because you don't know how to read. Mm. So like my whole life, I grew up with this whole I don't know how to read. Literally, I'm going to college. I'm like, I don't know how to read. And what that meant was like if I had to read something out loud, It'd be like, all right, don't know how to read. Like, read through what you're going to read through so you don't make mistakes because people are going to know you don't know how to read. Like, yeah. or something along those lines. And I literally had this, like, voice in my head. Just repeating it. Just over repeating and over. over and over again. And so I remember when you were like, yeah, let's read this book. And at that point, I was like, I'm not a reader. I don't know how to read. And so graduated from college once again, didn't know how to read. Just had this belief in my head. I was like, I got to read this faster than Chris. Mm. <laughs> So when, when we decided to read that book, dude, I just sat down and cranked through that thing, and I, like, loved it. I'm pretty sure back then there was no such thing as, like, an Audible. No. Right. I would have never learned how to read if <laughs> Audible was back then. But I remember just reading the book, and I'm like, one, that was an enjoyable book to read. Right. Two, it was easy. I was like, maybe I can read. I don't know. I can't read. It was just, it was just, it was just an easy book. Oh. And then we read another book, another book, and then I, like, 40 books in, I'm like, I love reading and I can read and Finally. it was great. It was fun. So I've read a lot of books. Um, you know, some of the books that were impactful, 10 X by Grant Cardone that, you know, going out in the summers, just grinding and just being in the, that mindset of like, keep going like that. That book was definitely one of those books you just throw on and it would get you pumped in the moment. Um, what are, uh, what are some of your main philosophies that you try to live by? Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, this is more around parenting. Um, but I believe, like, my kids, the relationships I have with my kids is established and kind of cemented by the age of, like, 12, 12, 13. And so my job as a dad is, like, to establish the best relationship I can with my kids by then. Like, that's it. That's, that's, the, check, that's the checkout point. At that point, what happens is my influence just starts to get diminished. It gets diminished by friends. It gets diminished by their independence. It gets depend, uh, diminished by just everything. And so if I don't have, like, the relationship I want at that point, like, I lost. My loss. Um, I have no clue where I heard that. I heard that years ago, and it's always stuck with me. And so, Feels like, right. Yeah, and so, like, I've always just, like, put a heavy focus on just – having a strong relationship with my kids. Um, and I feel like I have a phenomenal relationship. It's just, and it wasn't like, a, I'm going to try. It was like, I am like, that's who I am. Awesome. And that's been, that's been always like just a strong part of who I am. Very cool. Very cool. What, uh, what advice would you give to somebody that's struggling, getting going or thinking about giving up? young they're they're thinking about launching their first business you know some some along those lines what kind of advice you give that person man i wish uh i love sitting down with people and just letting them talk and just hearing all the lies that come out of their mouths and just helping them point it out you know not smash it in their face but just like do you really think this and do you really think that and like um you know today i was at the high school and i met with the finance club and you know one of the kids said uh it's like, I want to start a business, but, you know, I'm so scared of, like, what people will think, and, and I'm so worried about being rejected, and I'm like, hey, look, I get it. If you, you know, I've been through this a lot. If you're worried about being rejected, and if you're worried about what people think, don't get into business. Just do what everyone else does so you can fit in. And, and you know, for me, like, I don't want to fit in. Like, I just want to be me. I don't want to be like you. I don't want to be like anyone. Like, I want to be me. I want to take the best qualities of you and learn from those, and I want to take the best qualities of everybody else, right? Um, and I also want to offer the best qualities in myself, but, like, I don't want to fit in, and I don't want to be, like, part of the group. Like, I want to add a color to the group that doesn't exist. And so for me, um, like, 
when you go through failure, it's like, so, I mean, like that's part of the process. And someone told you at some point that, that, you know, avoid failure or failure is bad or like, um, but that, yeah, that's part of the process. One of the things that, uh, just went to a Tony Robbins event and he talks about, uh, Stephen Curry. Do you know how many three pointers he shoots every day? Mm, probably a hundred. You would think 500. Wow. That's a lot. So he's taken, uh, like, gosh, I have the stats on my phone. I think it was like 2.3 million shots over his career. Wow. Practice shots. And he's only made, like, in a game, like, I'm making this up now, but I think it's like 13,000 or something like that. He's got the most three-pointers ever made. Right. But if you look at him, I mean, the guy is just, like, flawless, right? <clears throat> I mean, I love, I love seeing some of, like, his warm-ups. He'll do, like, half-court shots or, or shots from, like, the stands or whatnot. And it's, and it's literally just, like, part of his process to, like, do the craziest crap. Yeah. yeah. And he doesn't care. Like, like, think about it, right? Why doesn't anyone else do it? Well, why would you shoot from that far back? And why would you shoot this? You know, he doesn't care. It's like his thing. And so, yeah, anyone out there who's struggling, it's like, dude, let that struggle be your thing. Now, I guess the, the advice I'd have, because I've been in a lot of struggle, is make a game out of it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I used to hate rejection, just like anyone else. And uh, I remember, like, getting door slammed on me, and I hated it. And for me, I was trying to be polite and stay there until the door slammed on me. And um, then I decided, you know what? The game is this. Before a door can slam on me, they see my back and I'm walking away. And even if that's mid-sentence, because you know when someone's just like going to slam the door on you, they're just, right. they're not giving you time of the day. They're treating you like crap, you know? And every time I, I would walk away before I get the door slammed on me, it would piss them off even more which would just get me fired up and get me ready for the next door. So I'm walking to the next door more excited because I just, you know, I just won that game versus getting the door slammed on me and just feeling like, you know, I got nothing to live for. So make it a game because... Love it. Yeah, we're always going to find uh, things that suck. Make great it advice, game. dude. Yeah. Uh, dude, where uh, can the listeners follow you or find you i know you're not very active <laughs> on uh, on social media but I, we're gonna get him there we're gonna get yeah him. find me at uh, chris lee qb <laughs> i have people all the time like yeah i've been watching you through chris's uh instagram <laughs> facebook i'm like cool <laughs> and, and literally i think people follow me more through through that than any other way um that's funny yeah no my my wife does a really good job too posting about our lives and then then i see you post about everything else so so, but where, where can they find you? I know you got like 800 followers or something. That's oh, pretty sweet on Instagram. Pretty thick right now. Um, <laughs> that's generous. Let me see here. Is it D Kelly 14? Yeah, you would think. Um, I'm pretty sure it is. He doesn't even know his own Instagram handle, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see here. D Kelly 014. D Kelly 014. D Kelly. K E L L Y zero one four on Instagram. How many followers are we sitting at right now? Ooh, it's up there. Five twenty one. Five hundred twenty one. Ladies and gentlemen, let's double that on the release <laughs> of this episode. I think it's private, right? Don't you have to like open it up? Yes, you get private. <laughs> I don't know. I think dude, it was unprivate. Dude, private. Who has a private Instagram account? Good night. Dear. Yeah, we'll have to look at that. Uh, sweet. Daryl, well, dude, thanks for, uh, thanks for being on the show. It was fun. We're going to have to do it again. Do it. We got a lot of stories to tell. Let's go. Until next time.